Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk, everyone. Today, we're going to be discussing a subject that doesn't get a lot of attention, and it's really going to dive in to what a home dialysis nurse does and how important they are to our survival. I mean, I was on PD for nine years and home hemo for a year, so... You know, my home dialysis nurse became almost like my family member. I remember uh, them even showing up at my wedding. So it's it's an interesting dynamic, and uh, we're so grateful to have uh, Casey Schuler today. She's a nurse with Fresenius Medical Care, and uh, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. So why did you decide to become a nurse and choose dialysis? So it was actually kind of, easy for me. I never really struggled with what I wanted to be when I grew up. I knew from a very young age that I always wanted to be a nurse. I always loved medical things, loved helping people, and so it was kind of an easy decision. Dialysis, on the other hand, kind of just happened. I fell into it by chance. I had a um, friend at the time who was actually a manager of an in-center clinic, and I actually started working with Fresenius um, as an in-center nurse. And then after doing that for a little while, I became a clinic manager, was a clinic manager for eight years at the in-center clinic. And then um, over the last three or four years, I decided I needed a change. And I have since fell in love with home dialysis and love working one-on-one with patients and having that kind of interaction. And so it's been a really great switch from in-center to home just to be able to see the whole picture of dialysis. Well, you spend a lot more time with your patients when you're at home initially for training, so you really get to know them because, you know, it's a different skill set. Um, can you explain that a little bit uh, in interacting with patients? Right. Um, that's one of the most important things, I think, for a home dialysis nurse is to have really good communication skills be able to multitask, and then to be able to form that relationship with patients because, of course, you're teaching them how to do a life-sustaining treatment, so you need to build that rapport and develop that trust with a patient, and you're right. You have a lot of one-on-one time um, during training. You're allowing us to come into your home, so it's definitely different from any other avenue in nursing that I've ever worked, whether it be like a physician's office or a hospital, dialysis is definitely its own its own little world. Well, and you have to have a lot of patience because it's like something that takes you a minute might take us five minutes when we're starting out, right? Correct, correct. <laughs> You're like, well, I could just do it already. So, uh, you know, in healthcare, it's very paternal in so many ways. So I, I really appreciate the home dialysis nurses who understand that it just takes patience and we have our own way of doing things and, you know, um, we have to learn how to figure it out and that takes a little longer. So so uh, can you maybe talk a little bit about the, the different home dialysis treatment options? Okay, so we have two options for home dialysis. So we have home hemodialysis, which is like a smaller scale version of what people are um used to seeing at an in-center clinic, an in-center hemodialysis clinic. So it's a, a machine that they have, um, and they have to then stick themselves, usually with needles, and it's a machine that cleans the blood. Versus we have another option of home dialysis called peritoneal dialysis, and that uses your membrane in your abdomen called your peritoneal membrane, and that acts like a filter to allow those waste products to come out. So it basically works by putting a solution in your abdomen and letting it dwell for a period of time and then draining it out. Well, you know, um, peritoneal dialysis was my my treatment of choice. Um, I did it for nine years, and I was actually the first pediatric patient to go on PD when I was... Uh, Oh God! What year was it? Early eighties, and it was it was a life changer because the I think what people don't understand when they're on in center is 
you know, you're only having treatments three times a week. And if you can do more frequent dialysis, which would be PD every day or home hemo, you know, multiple times a week, you feel better. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, and it's, uh, but, but it is a commitment. And, uh, um, and you also mentioned a little bit about um, cannulation. So when you're working with patients, is that one of the most difficult barriers? I mean, I can imagine I've heard a lot of, you know, push back. I would never stick myself. Right. And that usually, whenever we talk to people about home dialysis, just mentioning that word, that's automatically what they think. Um, That fear of cannulating themselves, sticking them with a needle or having someone else do that. And we really work very hard during training. Um, Our goal is repetition. So during training, we do the same experience over and over and over to make sure that people are completely comfortable with the process. And then after training is over with, we find that most patients are doing hemodialysis. They no longer want anybody else to stick them. So if they did have to have a treatment in the hospital or for some reason do an in-center treatment, they don't want anyone else touching their access. They would prefer to do it themselves. So it's kind of like it flips. Yeah, (laughs) they become well, once you become knowledgeable and engaged and, you know, all the little nuances, you understand how to do it better yourself. I mean, that's really what it is. And but it is fearful. So people are fearful and they just kind of put their head under the covers. Tell us a little bit about the benefits you see when people choose home. Um, One of the main reasons is the flexibility. So. You have that flexibility to determine when and where you're going to do your treatment. So if you decide one day that you want to do it at 8 o'clock in the morning or if you would prefer to do it at um, 7 o'clock at night if you're doing hemodialysis, you have those options and that flexibility to be able to work it into your life instead of being told when and where to be um, for a treatment. And it also gives our patient independence. So they now can take back some of that control over their care. And that usually, like, is a relief to them. Um, Yes. Yes, definitely. Well, when you, you know, you go to the clinic and then there was an emergency and whatever, your shift time's a little late. um, You just don't have total control over your schedule because medical care is... I mean, most of the time, hopefully it's on time, but I, I've yet to go to about 80% of my doctor's appointments are always a little late. So um, exactly. <laughs> it just happens. Um, and, you know, one of the things I think people don't quite understand about home hemo is that, or PD, is, of course, PD, you don't need a care partner. But with home hemo, I guess that's changing where people are doing a home hemodialysis themselves and not always required to have a care partner. Right. So we, a lot of our patients have care partners, just, but it's not a requirement. So as long as the patient is determined that they can safely do it by themselves, they're able to um, cannulate themselves, set up their machine, then they can be signed off as a solo home hemodialysis patient. And we have several of those here, and they do fantastic. We also have the option now to do nocturnal hemodialysis. And that's been a real game changer with our home patients because they kind of get the same benefit that some of our PD patients get by doing their treatments during the night, not taking up part of their day. And we actually just had one patient start that and they wish they would have started it a long time ago because they said it's just a game changer in their life to it's, be open to do new things. It's it's so true. You know, we adapt and then we realize like, oh, my God, all I'm doing is driving to the dialysis center. Right. <laughs> Exactly. And driving back. Um, you know, what's really interesting, and in, uh, I've been looking at this because there's such a push in the country to, you know, raise the number of people who are on home dialysis. And uh, and I just got an article published that people can look for. But I think, you know, we need to think about paying patients to do their own dialysis. And I'm, I'm just a big believer in that because, as you know, um, uh, and I think one of the areas that would really help is, uh, you know, having that space. I mean, when I lived in a single apartment 
and in Southern California. And luckily, I had a shed on the back porch. But, you know, the supplies are, you know, they're, they're, they're not a small amount. <laughs> and how do you work with your patients on that topic? For our PD patients, we now have a little bit of flexibility where um, some companies are allowing people to order every 14 days versus a full month supply at a time. So that's really helping out. But we like to kind of educate our patients prior to them even starting. So they'll know what to expect, know what the supplies will look like in their specific situation, um, kind of walk through with them where it would be best in their home to set it up. But no, you're definitely right. It it does involve supplies in your home. You will have to have, if you're doing hemodialysis, a place for your machine and usually your chair. Whereas if you're doing PD, it's a smaller smaller machine and you're asleep most of the time um, during your treatment. So that's not really an issue as much with the PD machine. But yes, definitely supplies. So we like to talk to people early on during their initial home visit about the quantity of supplies and kind of what it would look like in their situation. Well, and it's, it is, it's like you gotta, you know, I, I, I credit myself with being an expert at shipping and receiving <laughs> after being on dialysis for, for 10 years on home. I'm like, you know, I put that on my resume. Okay. Cause I handled shipping and receiving. Um, I often tell my peers that, you know, so many of the skills you learn, with this doing your own treatment are transferable to the real life work situations. And uh, it's definitely come in handy in my job today. Like, how do I know to do shipping and receiving? Well, um, I've you know, been managing my meds and my supplies forever. So um, I'm putting that on my resume. And I, I don't I, I suggest everybody else out there do, too. I think it's well-deserved. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then, you know, so tell us what else is involved with with training, because what is the patient responsible for? Walk us through it. So for peritoneal dialysis, usually training is about two weeks. I work for Fresenius, and I'm not sure what other companies do, but for Fresenius and for our specific clinic, our PD training is about two weeks. So the first week we teach patients how to do a manual process where it doesn't involve machines or electricity. It's just a solution bag and an IV pole. And that point we really touch on infection control, helping them with the steps, helping them to understand dialysis and what PD is actually doing to their body. And then the second week we then cover how to do the machine the cycler at night and setting it up. So after they're done, I mean, the patients are responsible for their dialysis. They're responsible to monitor their weight, their vital signs. The PD patients come to the clinic for lab work and doctor day. And then we have our home hemo patients. Their training is a little bit longer. It's usually about six weeks. And they're also responsible for the machine setup, the monitoring of their vitals. The one thing that they do in addition is they also are their own lab tech. So they'll draw their own lab. They have a um, centrifuge at their house. They'll send those labs down and um, are trained to then pack and ship them. So they're only required usually to come to our clinic just once a month just to be able to see the doctor. Also, you know, are televisits allowed if they need them or 24-hour support? So we do have 24-hour support for all of our patients. So with the specific machine, they have a 24-hour technical support for just the machine. And then all of our patients have our own call number where one of their nurses that they're used to seeing on a regular basis has that phone um, 24 hours a day. So if they have a problem 2 a.m. on a Saturday morning, they can speak to somebody that they know um, and can help walk them through um, whatever issue they may be having. So, yeah, they always have someone there for them. So if you have like a problem with the machine, you you have you call the manufacturer so they just tell you what's wrong with the machine and got an error code and then and then if they have something problem with like you know I'm having problems with you know my access or it feels weird or something like that then they call the nurse correct well and I think that you know once you become so familiar it becomes second nature but you know, you are performing a medical procedure, and uh, I always say that, you know, your body than a stranger, it's better to do it yourself. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, so, you know, what do you need from a patient to have a good outcome? 
the most important thing is just the motivation or the desire to do um, home dialysis. You would think that that would be everybody who chooses to do this, but it's not. So just somebody that's motivated, willing to learn, and wanting to be an active participant in their care. Those are the most important things for um, a patient to have a good outcome. Well, and, you know, as, as we know, um, there's a large, large majority of patients who are depressed, which I understand nobody likes having a life-threatening illness. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and if you're depressed, you're, you know, you may think, oh, I can just skip it today. And, you know, it's really not a good idea. But I was thinking, do you get a notification if the patient doesn't do their treatment? So we do. With both of our PD machines, everything is sent batched over to us, all of their treatment data. So we will be able to see almost in real time, usually it's whenever their machine shuts down in the morning, all of that data comes over to us. And then the same thing for our hemo patients. All of that data is then sent to the clinic for us to be able to review. So we know the next morning if you had an alarm on your PD machine that night, we can then call you and say, hey, I see you had this alarm. What kind of issues did you have? Or how did you help? Did you need help troubleshooting or anything like that? We can follow up on right away. Well, and it is. It's like Big Brother, but in a good way. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I know. I know. When I heard that they're selling, you know, refrigerators and with temperature control and, you know, that they have these little devices that can tell when you open it and what's in it. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, they're watching my food intake. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or, or how many times you open the fridge? I mean, there is there no more privacy? <laughs> I know. And I'm like, well, you've been eating at two o'clock in the morning. Okay, so, uh, what do you what What is one of the questions that you wish more patients would ask? For our in center patients or any new patient, I wish that they would ask more about their treatment options and allow the home therapy staff to come and do a home visit. At that time, we normally, if we get a referral for a new patient or somebody that expresses interest in home therapy, we can then go to their home and their setting, show them what it would look like in their home. Because it's completely different whenever you come to a medical facility versus in your actual home. And then we can sit down and explain to them what their treatment options are, what things would look like in their house, where they could store supplies. And then they also need to know that home therapy is doable. I mean, we have young patients, we have elderly patients, patients that work, patients that like to travel, and often they don't realize how much they are able to do for themselves, and so they just completely brush off the idea of home therapy. Right, and you know, I think a lot of times it comes into is, you know, we don't want to feel like a burden, and if, you know, we have a family and a busy family, you know, like, oh, I don't want to bring it in the home, but you're actually doing them a favor. <laughs> you're you're going to have more time. And and I know lots of families that dialyze. And it's a great experience for the children to understand it. I mean, they may be the future nurses that we need so desperately, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, and then um, what do you find um, the most challenging and rewarding about your job? Probably the most challenging would be, like you said, the patients that choose to just skip a day. Also, to your point, we are like a family, whether our patients want us to be their family or not. I mean, we spend so much time with our patients. We genuinely care. We care about them. We care about your family. And we would never want you to do anything that could potentially hurt yourself. So that's the most challenging is the patient's doing things that aren't always in their best interest. And then the most rewarding is, I mean, just to see somebody that you've trained that maybe didn't feel like they could do it and they just have a great outcome. Um, I kind of like that light bulb moment where it kind of everything clicks and they realize, yes, I can do this. Yes, this is better for me and better for my quality of life. 
Well, and it's just fascinating to see somebody grow like that and and start to believe in themselves because, you know, when your kidneys fail, it hits the very core of your being and, you know, who you are and what you can do. And I mean, it's just so complex. So uh, when you have more control, you feel better. (laughs) Um, And, you know, one of the things I was curious about is which home treatment or I mean, everybody likes to pick transplant, but which dialysis treatment option would you choose if you had to? And that is really a hard question. So if you would have asked me probably six months ago, I would have immediately said peritoneal dialysis. And probably that's the one I would choose, the modality I would choose to start with. Just because you can do it at night, you have your days free, it's a lot more gentle on your body, but it works best working with what residual function you still have. The only downside for me is tub bath. <laughs> um, I don't want to give up my bath. And with your peritoneal dialysis catheter, you aren't supposed to submerge in a bathtub. You can do like a um, private swimming pool or you can do the ocean. But I think that would be a really hard thing for me. Um, so lately I have been thinking about um, I might would choose home hemodialysis. Right. No, I went swimming and, you know, when I was on PD for nine years, I, you know, I love showers <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's nothing is clear cut. Um, there's pros and cons of everything. Exactly. But, you know, it's better than the alternative that we have so many options because and, and I'm preaching to the choir like a lot of other countries don't even offer dialysis. And I I tell people this, like, they're so upset. And I'm like, well, you don't have to dialyze. And they're like, what? And I'm like, it's a it's a treatment option. So if you're going to do it, you might as well commit in, in instead of just linger. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you're going to linger. Right. And, and it's going to make everybody miserable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the staff and and you know the family and you know you're just you're not helping us because uh, you know one of the things that's so important that everybody talk about right now is the healthcare shortage and you know the nursing shortage and I'm just a big proponent in you know patients and family members and everybody talking to their friends and family about becoming a nurse. Have you had any experience with being able to influence, you know, somebody choosing health care? And, uh, you know, what advice would you give to people who are listening to try to get the ball rolling? Definitely, yes, definitely there is a global um, staffing shortage, especially in health care. And I think that we need a whole to bring that focus into caring about other people again. Um, I think that's a huge part of some of the shortage. Um, Just not caring about other people and caring about um, what happens to other people. So definitely healthcare is in a a great field to go into. And you have so many options. Even within dialysis, you have so many options. What jobs or um, what roles you play within dialysis. Well, you know what? You know what? I always say the biggest reason of choosing healthcare is it won't be automated. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) that in a hairdresser, right? (laughs) Um, You need that hands on, you know, they're they're doing some things with computers that, you know, might come over and, you know, help and do some, you know, help the nurse with assessment. But I think. I don't know unless they put us in a bubble and then it up, you know, you know, like oh well, we're we're gonna you know take care of you in this bubble and I, I don't know use computers or something. I guess I'm I'm getting a little bit off base, but um, I think it's important that you know people choose you know careers that you have so many options in, and I'm just shocked all the time that there's just a shortage in so many specialties. Like from vets, I mean, if you try to get a vet nowadays, good luck. Um, and so, you know, what can we do to attract people to become more healthcare providers? And I really think the patients who, you know, feel that they maybe even want a job in the future, you should consider or now consider pursuing healthcare like me. I mean, I, I'm like, wow, uh, in the 90s, I 
I, you know, got my third transplant and I'm like, and I had other jobs and I'm like, I want something really meaningful. And I'm like, maybe I should just sell dialysis supplies. I know them better than anybody. And, you know, 30 years later, here I am, right? So it does get in your blood, this industry and community, because you have unique connections and they're like no other profession. You definitely do. And it's definitely rewarding. You may have some days that, I mean, everybody has a bad day um, now and then, but the majority of the time you have an amazing experience and your patients are truly thankful that you're there to help them. So it's definitely a very rewarding career um, to go into. Well, and if there's um, in-center dialysis nurses, I mean, is there training or how does that work? Is they're like, you know, I want to be a home nurse. I, I want to go that route. Or, you know, you also have acute nurses who go in the hospital. Is there some, is each, each company have like their own way of handling training somebody to be a, a specialized nurse? Now, I can't speak for any company besides Fresenius because they're the only dialysis provider I've worked for. But, yes, definitely with Fresenius. So just starting out in dialysis, they have an extensive education program um, just to work in center to talk about all of the different aspects of in-center dialysis. And then it is a requirement that you have that dialysis background for Fresenius to um, then transition to a home dialysis nurse. They want you to have in-center experience. And then, again, they also have um, a specialized education program just for the home um, aspect of it. So, yeah, I mean, you know, all you got to do is have some initiative, right? Right. (laughs) You can do anything. (laughs) Exactly. Have some initiative and apply. Exactly. Well, you know, I think this has been really informational. And, you know, I don't think that, uh, you know, you know, hug your home hemodialysis nurse today. That's all I can say. Or give her a high five if you're afraid of COVID. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, can we maybe close with a, um, an inspirational story that, you know, you know, you just remember the, of a patient you've, you've cared for? Well, recently uh, we have had a patient who was an in-center hemodialysis patient for going on six years. And they were younger, they're in their mid-30s, and they just never would entertain the idea of home dialysis, Um, had significant anxiety to the point where they would sit in the parking lot for about 30 minutes before coming in their in-center treatment just to kind of decompress and prepare. So really bad anxiety and social phobia. And we finally... um, kind of got small rolling with home hemodialysis and they have been an amazing patient. They went from being an in-center patient who as soon as they got on the machine would cover their head up with a blanket, not talk to anybody, to now they're independent, they're able um, to go places now and now they want to be a patient advocate and talk to other patients about how much home dialysis has changed their, their dialysis experience. They're a believer. Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so just, great. Yeah, it's just like, you know, I, we hear this story so often, and it's so nice to, um, you know, get people to, you know, go out and share their stories so that they can inspire other people. Like, I was like you, and it, it's not as scary. And, you know, I have to say, Casey, um, you have one of the best voices. Um, I <laughs> If I'm ever feeling anxious, I think I'm going to call you. <laughs> you have one of these calming voices. Do people tell you that? No, I was worried that I would sound too country on the phone. <laughs> no, you sound, you sound thank amazing. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> well, you do. You just like, I mean, you could, I think you could convince anybody to do anything with that voice. I'm going to tell my husband that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you could become a hypnotherapist. You will do home dialysis, right? I mean, well, and you'll be really successful. Easy whenever you believe in something and you see like how much it can change somebody's life. 
Right, exactly. I mean, it is. But I was like, oh, my God, I'm getting a little sleepy here be- in a good way. I feel relaxed. I feel relaxed. It's like, you know, I could see you training a patient and they're just like, you know, so comforted by your voice. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> because it, it's, you know, we patients read every sign, you know, we what is it? 80% of communication is nonverbal and right. then that 20%. But I just imagine you, you know, just being so calm. You have such a calming voice that I would take on that energy. So uh, that's a great quality. So, well, thank you so much, Casey, for being dedicated to the kidney community. We need more people like you. And if you're listening and you want to learn about home dialysis, ask your facility. And if your facility doesn't answer you in the way you want, you know, go to the Internet and, you know, check RSN, come to our support groups. Uh, we have a lot of ways to help you advocate for yourself and and to learn from others who have been on home dialysis. And it's important because I don't know it to be true, but I, I think it is. <laughs> uh, I find that people who do home dialysis actually get transplanted faster. And I think it may be because they've learned how to advocate for themselves on a different level. I agree. You know, and I don't know if that's been studied, this subject, but every time we get an advocate and, you know, they're really excited, they're on home dialysis, and then they're like transplanted. And I think that it just makes you more proactive, which is what you need to survive and thrive. So, And I think that's what the transplant centers are looking at. They know if you're dedicated to doing this to sustain your life, then you're going to do what you need to do post-transplant to keep that gift. Well, and it's true. It's a commitment. If you can dialyze every day or three or four times a week or whatever the prescription is, and, you know, the transplant center does view your adherence because if you don't take your transplant meds, and I take them twice a day, every day, <laughs> it, it doesn't go well for the beautiful gift that you received. So um, it, it's very understandable that they look at, at compliance. And doing your own treatment is the ultimate compliant person. It is. So, well, thank you so much for your your time, and uh, we'll see you we'll see you around, Casey. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good day. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.